At this point here, I, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Alexander, Ravi, and Diego to stage uh, to uh, tell the story about uh, MasterCard's journey. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Today, we're excited to share our journey uh, of developing an AI workbench at MasterCard. Our goal is to make AI and machine learning development easier and more efficient for our engineers. Today, we'll highlight some of the key features of the workbench that we've developed and share some of our high-level design choices that were made. We'll also compare the first and next generation platforms, showing how we've improved the user experience and support for the AI ML workloads. So we've got a few people up on stage. My name is Alexander Hughes. Uh, I've got 10 years of experience. I'm a director of software engineering at MasterCard. Eight years of experience working with Kubernetes. And the task and the charter of my team is to provide tooling and services to cover the entire MLOps flow to make it easy for our data scientists and ML engineers to train, to serve, and observe their models. Uh, next, we have Ravi. Yeah, I am Ravi Shankar Rao, go by Ravi. Uh, I am a principal software engineer in the same data science and AI group. I have about 25 plus years of data com and telecom experience, and I have been working with Kubernetes from past seven plus years. Hello, everyone. I am Diego Torres Fuerte, and um, I've been working with uh, MasterCard in the last two years, about. Uh, and I've been working for Red Hat for, uh, for eight years, and part of this journey also with Red Hat is to work with Kubernetes, with OpenShift, in order to containerize many of the applications that uh, you have there in the workloads for your solutions. And working as an architect for, for consulting services in Red Hat, um, I first met Ravi and Alex uh, because we were running a proof of concept to try out some of the features that they had in Kubernetes and Kubeflow uh, in running AI workloads. And we were trying to run, to run a proof of concept in order to see how they can work in Red Hat OpenShift AI. What can go wrong, right? Let's, <laughs> let's do a two weeks proof of concept. Long story short, we went into one year in trying to, to match with the different features that, that they were trying to do. But it's in this journey of the different features that they wanted to include into our Red Hat OpenShift AI product, our OpenShift Red Hat, um, open, Red Hat OpenShift AI product has also come into, into this evolution of the different com, com, concepts that we do in order to serve better our customers. And MasterCard, MasterCard has been a great adopter and, and, and a great um, client to push our engineering teams and our product forward. So we, not, we in Red Hat, we are very happy with the um, collaboration that we have with MasterCard during this adventure of having, evaluating the product for the different workloads that they are trying to migrate. So thank you, Alex and Ravi. Hey, thanks, Diego. It's been an exciting journey, so let's talk a little bit about that. But first, quick introduction to MasterCard. Uh, we're a global technology company in the payments industry. Our mission is to connect, empower, an inclusive digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere, by making transactions safe, simple, smart, and accessible. We leverage secure data and networks, partnerships and passion to deliver solutions and innovations that help individuals, financial institutions, governments, and businesses uh, to realize their greatest potential. So let's get started talking about four of the key areas of focus with this platform that we had in mind. Uh, first, we had an agile experimentation. We wanted to make sure that this platform empowered the data engineers and the data scientists with a rapid experimentation space, and we do that using Jupyter Notebooks. This is coupled with fine-tuned CPU and GPU profiles for sufficient resource utilization, allowing for quick iterations and innovative solutions. Next, we started to address the workflow orchestration for training. So we enable efficient and scalable machine learning model training through dynamic GPU allocation and specialized GPU cluster environments. We have centralized collaboration features that further enhance the training workflow, making it seamless and productive. Next, we wanted to address how we collaborate across features with the feature engineering. And we do that via feature lake integration. Uh, the platform offers the capability to seamlessly register, manage, and share features. This fosters collaborative feature engineering, ensuring that these teams can work together effectively 
and leverage shared resources. And finally, we wanted to optimize the training itself. And so we provide an environment that's tailored for large-scale training and experimentation, promoting faster model development cycles and enabling our teams to develop and deploy, deploy their models efficiently. So all of these capabilities come together, are designed to provide a seamless and efficient experience for our users. One of the key things that we're tasked with at MasterCard is, is a saying called months to minutes. If there's any opportunity to increase it, especially if we can increase it by an order of magnitude, that's our goal. So there's a few capabilities that this platform offers as we work through those four pillars. Uh, the first is ensuring that we have elastic compute, both in terms of CPU and as we start looking at more advanced AI use cases, we need a GPU acceleration. We do this with a hybrid environment where we have a single cluster where our data engineers can train and do their experimentation. And in that cluster, they can be assigned resources based on their use case, CPUs or GPUs. Next, we wanted to ensure that there was workload segregation. So we could segregate versus horizontal and vertical computes. Uh, and that's required for distinguishing between the ETL, or extract, transform, and load, and the machine learning pipelines. Next, everything that we do uh, in this workbench is based on Kubernetes. But we wanted to make sure the resources of the Kubernetes cluster that we're talking about were protected and isolated from general purpose workloads. And we do that with purpose-built pure AI ML clusters. This ensures a dedicated ecosystem tailored for those advanced purposes. In the realm of AI product development, we notice that our engineers are frequently performing uh, repetitive tasks. And so we've implemented an automated workflow instantiation, assisting with activities such as hyperparameter optimization, model selection, and feature selection. And the last thing that we wanted to do as we worked through all of the experimentation and training was make sure that the data engineers and the machine learning scientists could take their models that were trained and then serve them. And this model serving ecosystem allows us to support complex models with very fast inferencing times. So I'll hand it over to Ravi, and he's going to talk a little bit about the uh, MLOps flow. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for this great uh uh, overview of the AI workbench. Uh, before I start, I would like to get uh, uh, a hands up or a shout out from all the ML and data engineers in the room. Uh, I, I see not much of a representation here, but uh, um, I would like to talk what ML ops is, that is machine learning operations. Lately, there is a phenomena that people are adding this three letter word ops to everything. And it, is going, and it is also gaining a wide acceptance. Today, I want to um, prove that the ML ops concept is also uh, really goes well because ML ops is an organized way to achieve the machine learning problem. What is a typical machine learning problem? Uh, you collect data over a long period of time. And whenever this data set is collected, you want to uh, get an end result out of it, which may be a decision or a uh, prediction or some kind of scoring on it. The challenge for the ML engineer is to make sure this end result is accurate uh, most of the times and it, is, and it can be repetitive uh, and gives a good outcome every time. In order to do that, machine, uh, machine learning ops provides a very good playbook so that if a ML engineer follows that, then he will be able to achieve this end goal. Um, if we dig deeper, ML ops basically divides this into uh, feature engineering, then it allows us to sanitize the data and create data sets which can be used for training and validation. From there, we move to model training and model evaluation. By end of these two phases, we would have got a model which has attained a metrics and accuracy and precision that it is ready for using on a production data. With this, the next phase will be the model deployment, where the model that has been trained gets packaged into an application wrapped with the REST API, providing an inference endpoint. Using this, the end users can consult it and then get their predictions accurate every time. 
The other important aspect is the model monitoring piece where it continuously monitors the feature drift and the prediction drift and keeps up the model up to date so that this ML ops environment provides you the end result what a ML engineer expects. Now I want to move to um, the AI workbench, the first generation where the MasterCard wanted to um, provide this platform for our data scientists. The main goal, the design goal or the implementation was to enable uh, three things. One is to do the feature engineering, then to do the model training using GPU acceleration and also to do some of offline scoring cases. For this, we stood up this entire workbench in a totally disconnected environment uh, so that um, we could make use of the treasure trove of data that MasterCard had. We also used the upstream Kubernetes components in order to bring in the declarative approach. Then we integrated all the components of the Kubeflow and the Spark operator so that the data scientist can run their AIML workloads. Towards the end of this, what we actually achieved was we were able to in an automated way, deploy uh, quite a few AI workbenches in dev, stage, and prod environment. And we were able to onboard a large set of data scientists on this platform and able to deliver some value-added solutions. The most important aspect was we were also able to bring in the GPU compute, which accelerated the training and moved it from weeks to days. Next. For us, the next question is, what is the next generation AI workbench would look like? In order to get this, we had to answer two important questions. What we want to keep and what are the things that needs to be changed? If you look at the architecture carefully, um, we moved from upstream Kubernetes to um, MasterCard Kubernetes, which is based on OpenShift based, backed by Red Hat. By moving to this platform, we got the LMA stack of the MKS and also the NVIDIA GPU operator from the uh, operator hub. This gave us a very solid uh, base, which was more secure. And also, the vendor-backed support from the Red Hat was available for this. Now, we started the row AI uh, evaluation, as Diago mentioned, we work closely with their team in order to not only find the Kubeflow equivalent components, but also to see what additional value adds we can bring in so that we can bring in the remaining pieces of the MLOps into this new platform. Uh, and we also started bringing in all the services in a more organized way, and we called it as something called the playgrounds. I will touch on the playgrounds a little bit later. Uh, the next slide, I want to concentrate on what are the major comparison between the first gen and the next gen. Um, the nailing down of GPUs, the number of GPUs, and the uh, slices for each of the workloads at the workbench creation time caused a lot of friction. So we wanted to make this an on-demand GPU allocation and reservation. Uh, so that the GPUs can be effectively used. So we added some intelligence into the platform so that the GPUs can be shared not only across users but also across the workbenches by providing the capability of loaning and reclaiming the GPUs. Uh, the other two aspects I want to quickly touch is the user onboarding. We wanted to decouple it from the release and make it so that um, this can be achieved by requesting a ownership of a playground, and once they are done, they can relinquish it. Now, uh, I want to quickly touch about what is playgrounds. The playgrounds was designed to give a major role from the very early inception phase for product owners working closely with AIML tech leads, they can determine how much resource is needed in order to realize a ML solution. Once they do that, uh, they work with platform team to create X number of playgrounds, and then 
Playgrounds are nothing but a combination of an OpenShift project or a Kubernetes namespace associated with a Git repository and um, has certain set of resources allocated to it. It also has a bunch of tasks, stacked on tasks, that will help them to carry out their application on that particular namespace. Now, once a data scientist starts his development, he is going to request a ownership of one such playgrounds, and then he is going to implement his business logic in the manifest in the Git repository associated with the playground, and then uh, he just initiates the pipeline run, which is going to uh, run the Tekton tasks, pull the manifest from the repo, and deploy it on the OpenShift namespace or the project that was associated with it. This way, he has the flexibility to do multiple iterations on this, and then until the business logic is validated, he has full flexibility to keep running this multiple times. The other capability of Playground is also that it provides multiple data scientists can request ownership of it so that they can do collaboration uh, either during the development or the integration phase. Now, I want to quickly talk about our very first uh, uh, service, which is the Spark uh, job as a service, which was implemented using Spark Playground. If you look here, the tasks associated with this were categorized into four uh, classifications. The first one is the fetch and setup, where, uh, as the name suggests, was used to pull in the manifest related to the Spark job from the Git repo and set up some workspaces so that it can maintain the state of the application. The second one is the validation phase, where the actual validate validity is conducted to know if this application is really uh, for my Spark workload. If it is not, then the uh, pipeline stops here. Otherwise, it moves to the next phase, which is the create and injection. This is where we add the intelligence of converting a Python script or any other uh, side uh, supported environment needed for running the Spark application into a config map and injecting them into the Spark manifest. And then the final piece is the deploy and monitor. This is where we uh, deploy using a kubectl action and have dedicated tasks to monitor and track the status from submission to the uh, completion state. Next uh, slide basically gives an overview of how a Spark pipeline looks on an OpenShift dashboard. Uh, any AML engineer can get, uh, after assigning a playground, will be able to log into this, go to the pipeline, execute his jobs, and track its status. Uh, with this, I'll hand over back to Alex to go over some of the survey results that we had. Hey, thanks, Ravi. So we're getting close to time, so I just want to put up uh, an internal survey of what our users said and how they responded to the platform and, and how we've seen the platform progress. Um, the users are, are quite excited about Kubernetes and the performance that they get and the scalability of it. They're pretty happy with the support that they get from the platform teams that, that Ravi and I work on, and they're mostly happy with how easy it is to consume the data. There's a couple opportunities here. There's a lot of great things, but I want to point out a couple opportunities because this is where we're going to focus on next. Uh, On-prem, it seems that there's never enough GPUs, and so this is a negotiation with our users to make sure that they're tailoring their jobs uh, efficiently, they're using the right models to train with, uh, and then purchasing more GPUs, certainly. There's always a question of how easy can we make it to access the data in line with our data governance policies trying to improve some of the dynamic allocation of these pipelines, and then documentation. We document everything, but there's always going to be questions, you know, how can I find the answer to this particular question? So I think we're just about at time, so we're not going to take any questions here, but I'd love to chat with you in the uh, coffee break after this and answer any questions that you have there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.